Greg Ashton has led a fantastic new piece of work studying the Vela Pulsar, which he's going to tell us all about. It was published very recently in Nature Astronomy. Greg, tell us about this work and how it all came about. We have a, a colleague, Vanessa uh, Graber, who's at McGill, um, and we were talking to her a while back about uh, models of, of neutron stars and, and how they perform when they do this thing called a glitch. Um, and a glitch is, is roughly speaking where the, the radio pulsars, so we see these things um, sort of pulsating uh, with some frequency, and then at some point they suddenly sort of increase that frequency and we call that thing a glitch. Uh, now Vanessa's done some really exciting sort of work to model that, um, and her work predicts that if there's three parts to the star, um, then you get a really complicated behavior. Um, and so we were kind of interested in testing this out. Um, and so then uh, I think it was sometime last year or so, uh, we were chatting and you pointed out that uh, you knew Jim Palfreman down in Tasmania, who had some data looking at the Vela Pulsar. Um, and so we got in contact with him, got hold of that data and, and did the modeling and, and found you know, evidence for this, this effect, which seems to imply that there's three parts to the star. So why is this interesting that there are three parts to the star? Uh, well, what's kind of fascinating is that neutron stars are, um, so they're, they're extremely dense. You take something like the mass of the sun um, and you crush it down to about 10 kilometers uh, in, across or so. Uh, and so that, what that means is that this is some of the most dense material in the, w in the, in the universe, sorry. Um, and we can't really recreate that on the Earth, uh, but you can study neutron stars or use neutron stars to study it in sort of cosmic laboratories. Okay, so there's three components of the star. So there's this outer crust, and then there's two components in the core. Uh, and they're both described by this superfluid, which is really this sort of quantum soup, the really exotic material, which we can absolutely create in the lab. Uh, but when we create them in the lab, they have very different properties to what we, what we believe exists inside a neutron star. But ba basically these fluids move through each other without any viscosity, they interact through quantum processes, uh, and they're sort of an exciting way to study these interiors of the neutron stars and understand matter at those levels. So I wonder if you could tell me a little bit more about what we actually found uh, with that data. So uh, when we dug into it, uh, there was kind of um, three, three main findings of, of the research. One was that we, uh, we managed to constrain the time of the glitch, uh, so how long it takes, if you like, for this, this neutron star to spin up. Um, and we constrained that to be less than about 13 seconds or so. Um, that was really interesting because it's the tightest constraint we have yet. Uh, the second thing that we found was that as it, uh, as it spins up, it actually sort of overshoots where it should get to. So it spins up um, and then spins down just a little bit. Um, and so that's the part which tells us about the fact that there, there might be three components to this star. Um, and then there was a third part which was really unexpected for us, um, which was that just before the glitch, we actually saw a kind of slowdown um, or anti-glitch, uh, which, which comes just before that glitch. Um, and that part we really don't understand. So the physics is, is extremely unclear. Um, there's no models which predict that behavior. Um, and so the job now is really to, to figure out what's going on um, and you know, see if that can tell us something more about neutron stars. Can we go back to the first finding then? Why is 13 seconds interesting or what's interesting about this time scale? So that time scale constrains uh, the properties of the superfluid. Um, and so you can use that to, to say something about what kind of superfluid it is. So what's, what's next in this research? So you discover this anti-glitch or this preceding slowdown. How can we verify whether that's real? How can we model you know, exactly what's happening inside the star or look at more data? So the real issue with that anti-glitch in terms of our research was that we didn't have a good physical model for what caused it. Um, so there's one aspect is to go and, and uh, work with theorists to uh, develop physical models. Um, which sort of you know, make predictions for how that, that forms. Um, we're also looking at another direction, which is to say, well, okay, could we be more model agnostic um, and just come up with some way to sort of fit this uh, and just sort of let the data speak for itself in that sense. Um, and then there's sort of you know, work to be done in sort of determining how significant that result is. Um, so what we've seen so far tells us it is, it's very loud, it's very clear in the data, um, but we'd like to sort of cross-check that with other data sets um, and make sure that you know, our finding is, is really robust. Where can people find out more about this research? So uh, you can go and head to the links which are at the bottom of the video um, and that will take you to our paper on, on this research.